a game against a grandmaster for the first time is probably a dream some of you uh, who are watching this are having. Uh, I remember it vividly the first time it happened. It was in 1990. I was a young man, uh, around 19 years old, and uh, and I won against a, ga a game against an old Soviet uh, grandmaster who had beaten Mihal Tal and so on. And it's only line. He was he immigrated to the U.S. in 1976, and I met him in. Gausdale in Norway. Back then, uh, Gausdale was a legendary place. They had a lot of tournament, and uh, this old guy, uh, Arnold Eichrem, was a very funny guy, by the way. Uh, he held these tournaments in uh, Gausdale. So a lot of the Danish players uh, went to Gausdale and play and play there. And I once uh, saw Kramnik there. Uh, he was just an FM, uh, and he had a rating of I think twenty five ninety five. <laughs> that was uh, that was something. Um, by the way, let's see the game. Um, it was a uh, it was it was a decent game. I think uh, I had a rating of twenty three fifty five. And by the way, at that time I had big problems against grandmasters because I s seemed to lose no matter what happened. I was just losing uh, more or less every game. So uh, and and. By the way, that continued a little bit after this. Uh, it was it was only later I somehow managed to uh, stabilize or stabilize uh, my play against uh, grandmasters because they just put pressure on you all the time, and and if you have any kind of weaknesses, they will find it and they will exploit it. Uh, line plays the queen's gambit declined, and we have the exchange variation and the. Uh, after all, very well-known uh, Carlsbad structure, which we have had a lot of videos about here on GM Talks. We are some sort of an expert. We can see that back then I played the exchange variation, which I still do sometimes um, with white. And Bishop f5, and by the way, that was uh, that was not that well known at the time. That this line is probably not bad, uh, not bad at all. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's a line that that Kramnik has played. I have played this line as well with black. I played it against uh, Peter Lico and got an easy draw. Uh, I was probably already better in the ending. Uh, I also played this with, with black against some uh, German player, and he played knight e2 here, but the, the which is not such a bad move, by the way. Uh, but the the main move is queen f3, attacking the bishop. Uh, by the way, of course, it would be nice if black can get this bishop out unpunished. The problem for black in many openings is to get this white squared guy out of the bat. And uh, he's just sitting down here. And that's also why, in, uh, for instance, after, after the most to come, why play something like this and, and try to keep this, uh, this guy out of the game. Uh, it's not a bad bishop because it has room and it can be good somewhere, but it's it's somehow an unemployed bishop. But so bishop f5 is a, it's a radical way of solving this problem immediately, but it unfortunately leads to uh, the destruction of uh, black's pawn structure. By the way, I played this move first. I'm not sure why I did that. By the way. Uh, a6. I think the main move is to take immediately, um, and and uh, and I didn't really get this uh, this this thing. So I, here I played uh, the move h5, which probably is just weakening the pawn. Uh, so I'm not sure uh, that was such a good idea. Um, I didn't know uh, these kind of deep uh, strategic things that I got to know later uh, a lot, uh, a lot about. Um, and but we can see that Black's pawn structure is very bad. But apart from that, that also means that he has uh, open files, and he does have a majority on the queen side. Uh, and and these pawns uh, are maybe weak, uh, but if they cannot be attacked, then they are not weak. Uh, and they will uh, a pawn here will 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 really uh, make a lot of uh, influence in the center. Um, bishop here, that was the idea. So I thought something like this, and then I will get to this square with a knight, and he will be uh, punished. But uh, then he played this move, which is already a really bit bit annoying because I don't have time to to get the f5 square. Uh, uh, without uh, weakening something so i had to play g3 and that was not that was not really the plan 
uh, bishop e7, knight here, thought, okay, I can take another route, and he played f5, of course, which is uh, essentially, it's it's a weak pawn, but it's it's not so easy to attack, uh, but I did attack it, um, and he took, took an, a knight f6, rook d1, I realized I was on the words of losing a pawn, and I was also a little bit annoyed that it seemed already that black has at least equalized, I think black is f definitely fine here. Um, on this this position is uh, is 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 of course uh, nice for black. Uh, knight e4 uh, was not necessary, uh, and he could take here, but it's also not necessary. Uh, king e7, rook d8, king d6, um, rook d1. By the way, okay, here is a very uh, sort of uh, instructive moment in the game. Um, at the moment, uh, Black's Knight is very good here, uh, the Rooks are active, um, and we know uh, from the Carlsbad video that Black's plan consists, uh, is something like this. But maybe, just maybe, you should improve the position on the Queen side first. So, which move would you play as Black here? Give yourself, you can pause the video, give yourself a little bit of time to think about it. Uh, as an, I'm now a sort of old, uh, experienced Grandmaster, it's kind of easy. You just feel that this is the right move to play uh, A5. Um, and and the, the idea is, yes, you, you want to play C6, B6 and C5, but you first want to improve the position on the queen side, get more space, uh, make white uh, worry about the pawn going all the way up here, Oops, sorry, here. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, even uh, sending the rook out uh, this way. Um, so. Just and keeping the knight here on e4 is beautiful. There, uh, of course, uh, another square could be this square for it. Uh, but at the moment, everything looks fine. It can also go, go back here where it keeps uh, an eye on, on these two uh, important squares. So, I think a5 and black has a slight but clear advantage. It's clearly that white does not have any constructive plans. Uh, that's a big problem, uh, and uh, you could hope for some minority attack, but after a5, that's just hopeless, because uh, the, the white king will get into trouble. And uh, we also see that even though these pawns are nominally a weak, they are also controlling a lot of squares and keeping white from doing anything. So what kind of plan? Uh, the only plans white have will uh, consist in exchanging this uh, this guy here that is supposed to be weak. So a5 is 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 the obvious move uh, in, in hindsight. Um, he plays then knight g5. I'm not sure I like, I got my rook uh, and knight here. And, and this could be a nice square for the knight, but I'm not sure it's, it's the best square. Um, he is probably threatening to take uh, on e f4 and, and put something in the, the e file um, or in the d file and f6. And he got, he lost this square now. By the way, there's a rule of thumb uh, for, and I've talked a little bit about this uh, before, uh, for, um, for playing with double pawns. The further they advance, the weaker they get. So don't advance your pa your your isolated uh, double pawns, especially here. So f6 is definitely wrong, um, and also uh, it it makes well a lot of things bad happens. But all of, most of all, it takes away this square from the knight. So the knight cannot go here where it was excellent. Uh, it's much better than here. B6. He's starting to prepare the plan, but he did not include f5, a5, a4, uh, which he should have, and uh, and already um, white is and and the king comes to the rescue. is going to cover this pawn so uh, to to liberate the rooks. By the way, we can also see now that with a pawn here, that would be not as nice because b2 could be attacked maybe with something like this. Um, so, so it's not so easy to. So there's a lot of uh, ideas behind uh, getting the king, the, the the pawns going on on a5. 
c5 and that's that's simply simply bad uh, it's not well prepared and black is not ready for this move um, and um, and after this i have this move and the knight is going to this excellent square where it will keep uh, everything under control and attack uh, the weak now hanging pawns so black has messed this up uh, completely and um and that was nice for me king e2 and white is better here rook d2 keeping pawn and we also again see that it would have been nice to have the pawn here uh, keep oops sorry um this pawn would be nice here. Yes. Uh, just so, so uh, that's very instructive. And uh, we also see that white has this uh, annoying uh, check here all the time. So black sort of panics and plays d4, which just gives him, uh, instead of the hanging pawns that had some uh, dynamic potential, he's, he's suddenly uh, just got bad, really bad pawns. Rook c1. Um, and and by the way, my technique at that time was not as good as it is now, uh, but it was enough to win this position. And check, not not afraid of anything, and getting the rooks in for an attack. And we see this knight here is controlling this uh, square. And everything has gone really bad for black. Um, you have to exchange this one, and the king just goes up and and win something um and here it's easy i don't think i played it completely uh fantastic here uh, but but what i did was was okay uh, i guess um check 95 and i realized the the poor the, the night ending was very easily winning uh, remember the rule uh that eight pawns or or pawn on the rare end of the are much much uh, more dangerous in knight endings than in any other endings uh, because knights are uh, are sort of not good at uh, moving on far distances so in in this kind of situation you you much more would prefer an, an h pawn to a d pawn because then the king could help on the knight will be get to it easier and well he realized that it, it was not changing anything and so white is winning by the way he was a he was a very pleasant man uh, this uh, anatoly lane um, he someone uh, gave him a, a weird chess clock and he was going around with it and playing with it uh, and he was so happy like a little child it was uh, it was kind of nice um, i was I think he, uh, he he moved to the us in 1976 uh, he was I guess he was Jewish, uh, and and of course uh, the Soviet has not been uh, that nice a place for for Jewish players. So a lot of them went to the U.S. I think uh, Gulko and uh, Shamkovitz and and so on. Uh, I don't know much about American chess from the 70s. Uh, also, Elbert uh, is springs to mind. Uh, King c6, knight here, and I'm I'm at the moment I'm up three pawns. And get this, but this f pawn is. And please notice there is a is a, is a trick here. Knight b6 and knight b6. And I don't know what I was doing here. Um, rook c6. And well, I think the plan was to to just go with the pawn. Uh, I was trying to to get that to go. Rook c5. And here I was, I was starting to to think maybe I can. Uh, I can checkmate him. Um, something like uh, King C3, B3, and Rook A5. So I'm threatening this here and here with checkmate. Rook A1 is one. B3, King A3, Rook A5, King B2. I could take A7, but uh, then he would trick me but i would uh, by taking eight uh, d6 and knight c8 but it's still winning of course with all the pawns but why not just play this move which is very 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 easy and the f pawn is much much uh, more dangerous than the h pawn so it's it's simply winning 
and I was very thrilled to win this game. At that time, I was not even an IM. I only became an IM, I think, three years later. Uh, and but at, after winning this game, I, I thought I was sure I would be an IM. Uh, it was just a question of time, and I also felt that I had a decent chance, probably, of becoming a GM. I think. Uh, I was not sure about that uh, because just becoming an IM was a big goal, but but later on I, I, I realized that okay I could also become a GM. By the way, it's it's interesting how difficult it is to learn to play against grandmasters when you're a, a young player. You just seem to lose in all kind of weird ways, and it's just like uh, really really tough to play against uh, these uh, these these GMs. And of course, I, I I realize now that I like to play against young players because they have uh, sort of. Um, mistakes in their game that you can exploit because they are not sort of fully baked uh, or if you <laughs> use the expression so they they have some uh, some things they simply don't know or don't understand yet and uh, and if you find that you can you can get rather easy wins against the uh, young players anyway this was uh, gm talks with a very old game uh, by me from 1990 uh, winning my first ever game against a grandmaster and i can still remember the happiness i felt i was like floating in the air uh, thank you for watching